Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, OK, great. Um, good afternoon. I'm Kevin Doherty. I'm managing director of uh, Fitch in Dubai. You can see the title of the uh, presentation I'm going to talk to you about. I thought it was really interesting listening to the last presentation, particularly when they talked about you know, the importance of the human within this and keep going back to you know, the human need. And, and I think that's absolutely true, and it's very much something that uh, lives throughout the, the thinking that, that Fitch have. And I think you'll see that throughout this presentation. So <clears throat> for those of you who don't know Fitch, uh, we're the world's leading brand and retail consultancy. Uh, we've been around since 1972, so quite a pretty long time. Uh, 15 studios in eight countries and over 400 people. Um, work for big global brands. Uh, we work for Sephora doing their omnichannel strategy, M&S. Uh, and in this region, we work for Centerpoint doing their store of the future, uh, actually in Doha. Uh, we did Home Center uh, in Mall of the Emirates. Uh, and if you ever walked into a do store about 10 years ago, maybe longer, we designed those. <coughs> so um, in terms of what we do, uh, we execute in graphical design, we execute in 3D design and digital. But right at the heart of everything we do is strategy. And it drives everything that, that we do and the way we think. And we put the human at the heart of that strategy. Um, and then we work out the right solutions uh, for, for that human-centered need. Uh, and then we deliver them, as I said, either through graphics, creating logos and brands, uh, through motion graphics but also through 3D design, from architecture through to the interior design, the customer journeys, uh, right through to sort of rollout strategy and format strategy. Um, and then also uh, through digital. And digital for us can be as simple as a web or a website or an app, or something a lot more complicated and a lot more relevant to the sort of world of retail that we're best known or experience that, that Fitch is best known for. Um, so you know, we have a lot of creative technologists uh, within our studios. But as I said, at the heart of everything is strategy. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how that strategy makes those connections between the physical, human, and digital. So <clears throat> we talk about designing the future. And why we talk about it that way is that we talk about is that we, everything we do is, is driven by insight. So we have um, strategists sitting in every single office across the globe, sharing information. Uh, we see all the trends that are happening, not on a micro level, but on a macro level. And some of the stuff that's happening out in, say, um, out in the East is really interesting. And some of the stuff in America is also very interesting, particularly regarding sort of big box retail and all the issues they're facing there. Uh, and so I'm going to talk you through a series of case studies that dramatize our approach. And the last one I think you'll find very interesting as a way to look at the challenges a lot of shopping centers are facing with brands closing down and stores closing down, and an interesting and innovative way of reacting to that. So online, offline, et cetera. So what is online? Online is all about convenience. It's very simple. Uh, <coughs> reasons why you shop online, 73% shopping for, from the comfort of home, 55% accessing wider choice, 49% uncovering great deals, 27% uh, sourcing products quickly. Comfort, range, price and speed. It's all very simple. Uh, <clears throat> so online shopping is all about convenience. So if online is so convenient, what's the point of having stores? If all that we need is, something to, is to find things in a really quick and simple manner, what is the point of having stores? So one of the interesting things that we're noticing is the online halo effect of physical retail. So what do I mean by that? When a store opens in a trading area, online and social traffic go up 45% for new brands and 36% for established brands. Online sales go up between 20 and 40% on average. And at, other, at, at the end, they go up, some of them have gone up over 300%. Lifetime value can increase by over 50%. So <clears throat> basically, if you open a physical store, it has a positive impact on your online sales, right? So that becomes a really interesting dynamic and a really interesting way of thinking about physical stores in a very different way. 
So rather than purely judging them on the sales per square foot of the store, maybe we can start to look at them in a different way. Maybe there's a case to look at them as a tool for acquisition and therefore judging them on cost per acquisition and therefore lifetime value. <clears throat> I'm going to come back to that, but that's a really interesting way of, of starting to think about physical stores. But when you ask people why they shop in a physical store, their reasons are very simple. Being able to try the products, being able to browse on a whim, socializing with friends, and the store atmosphere. It's all about experience. Oh, sorry. So, stores are all about experience, and about Five, ten years ago, that was a very simple thing. Everybody was rushing into digital, so experience means digital, okay? So here is an example of a store we did about ten years ago when the whole world was rushing into putting digital into, into, um, into their stores. And I just want to show it to you as an interesting case study of what we learned from this. So, as I mentioned, done several years ago. Um, we got quite a lot of learnings. Anyone have any views on what they thought would work and what wouldn't work from that store? Any more thoughts? So, things that, that didn't really work for us. Just putting the website in there doesn't really work because you're in a store, so why would you need the website? Other things that didn't really work were the sort of magic mirror when you're trying, trying on a, or, or when you're not trying on a clothing, you're actually having it sort of reflected onto the mirror because you've got a change room next to you, and you've got the physical garment. The feedback that we got of the things that worked really well <clears throat> were things like the measurement, where we use digital to measure your size and give you an ac accurate measurement. Uh, what else worked really well was the comparison, being able to see your, a an image of yourself with, uh, with different articles of clothing in side by side, and also the style pro, uh, where you would sit down and you could consult with somebody. And if you take all of those things back, what that really means is basic human needs are being met, right? So the need to know exactly the right size so I can go and find that product. Uh, the need to see which of these two things fits me or suits me best and having a comparison um, side by side. You've, you've met my need, you've, you've helped my um, purchase decision. But also the dealing with somebody, to consult with somebody um, to help me find the right decisions, to explore different options, to consult and guide me. The human bit came through really, really strong. Um, so great having a physical store, great having digital in it, but really the human bit was kind of the glue that really held it together. 
And fundamentally, people make a difference. Designing around the person makes a difference. So let's start with people. About, uh, also about 10 years ago, we, um, we came up with this a hypothesis on the way that uh, shoppers shop uh, and the mind states they're in. Uh, and we call them locating, exploring, and dreaming. Um, I always use mobile phones as a really simple example of this. So locating would be a, lo as a locating mission. So I, I need a, a, a set of Apple headphones. I just want to go into the store, find them really quickly, pay for them really easily, and get out. That's a locating mind state. An exploring mind state is I'm looking at two different phone options, uh, the new Samsung and the new Apple. I haven't made a decision, and I want you to help me make the right decision. I want you to or validate the decision I, I'm, I'm making for myself. So help me explore the options and get to the right answer. And dreaming is, I'm really interested in tech. Can you inspire me? Right? Can you just show me the internet of things or connectivity in the house? Just inspire me. Make, make something that's going to make me want to come in on a whim. So we developed this hypothesis of these three mind states, and we, and we, uh, we looked at them globally uh, and validated them through research. And these mind states exist. We all have them. They're not a segmentation, and we can flick between them. We can flick between them on, from one shopper journey to another, and sometimes we can even flick between them when we're actually uh, on, a, on a, a, a single journey. So for example, I've dropped my phone, I've cracked the screen, I just want to go and get it fixed. So rushing into shop, I'm in locating mind state, they say, fine, we can do this, 10 minutes, no problem. At that point, I've got 10 minutes to kill. I flick into dreaming. So it's not that one mind state is more important than the other. There are three mind states, and we continually move between them. And we as retail designers, as store designers, uh, as retail consultants, we need to think about those three mind states uh, of locating, exploring, dreaming, and work out how we get the balance between them in our different formats, but also um, looking at the journey, the journey of the, of, of the shopper, um, not just in store, but also offline. Because as retailers, we have different touch points to respond to those, dreaming, those mind states. And those touch points are physical, human, and digital. So the physical is an immediate, immersive, and tactile experience. So it's, you know, it's the podium here. Um, the human is empathetic, it's approachable, it's kind. It's the, it's the reasons we trust people. It's the reasons we want to go and talk to people. And the digital is, is, a, is a rich uh, medium to tell connected stories, to tell interactive stories, to, to engage over the sort of long term. So we look at the consumer and shopper needs from those mind states, and then we map out the journey uh, through the physical, human, and digital touch points we have, both in store and out of store. And it's not that one of those is right and one of those is wrong. It's not that one of those is more important. It all depends on the shopper need. So if you put yourself in the shoes of the shopper, you can then work out the solutions uh, to their needs through these touch points. And I'm going to show you a few different examples of where we've, we've mixed up those three aspects in different ways to get to the right solution for that particular brand. So this is uh, Mealy. This is a, a store that we created for um, one of their experience centers that was going to go into town. So Mealy have large experience centers, usually out of town. This is in uh, Canada, usually out of town. And uh, those experience centers have all their equipment and, and shows off everything that they, that they, uh, that they can do. The problem with out-of-town large boxes is that they're beginning to die. In, certainly in America, they're beginning to die. And people aren't traveling out to see them. So their challenge to us was, how do you create an experience center in a small space in the heart of the, heart of the city? Uh, and the solution to that was, we need to use digital, but we need to use it in an innovative and interesting way. Uh, and rather than just having screens, we started thinking about, well, how, how about if we use the product itself as our screen, as our palette for our digital solutions?
So as you can see, that's a really small store, and we had the challenge of showing off some products, but also dramatizing the benefits of, of the product, uh, you know, using digital to do it, and not having the screen space to do it. So we simply used the product itself, used projection onto the product, used digital in an interesting way that reacted to the needs of the consumer, which was to really understand why they should spend more on Mealy, which to understand the differences, the Mealy difference in their products. This next one is, um, is Hamleys in Moscow. Uh, and Hamleys in Moscow is the largest children's store in the world. And they, they basically they came to us and said, we want to create the best children's store, the greatest children's experience store in the world. Very simple. And so we kind of started thinking about how children's stores were laid out and how they're, how they're sort of uh, run. And they're very operational. You know, you have lots of stacks of, to of toys. And if you think about them, you know, everybody's got children here. If you go to a children's store, what is the one thing they want to do? They want to pull everything down and they want to play with it. So why don't we actually design a store that's really for the children rather than the adults and rather than traditional sort of ways of, of, of retailing uh, and actually allow them to sort of have this immersive world of play? Uh, and that's what we did here. And when you've got an immersive world of play, when you've got lots of toys, you want to play with the toys. You don't really need to put a lot of digital in there because they've got the toys there to play with. And that's what we did with this one.
families. Put yourself in the shoes of the, of the shopper or the consumer, which in this case is small children, and you get to a place where you don't need digital. You just need a place where they can play. Um, the next one is that perfect combination of physical, human, and digital. And it's for a, a brand called Arshlik, which is a, a Turkish white goods brand. And traditionally, Arshlik had presented all its goods in a very sort of basic warehouse way. So you had your, your fridges and your freezers lined up and your cookers and your food processors and, and your hair straighteners. And it was all done in a very sort of you know, warehouse uh, regimented way. <clears throat> what we wanted to do with them is, and they, they were a dominant brand in their market, we had an opportunity with them, because they were quite brave, to try and push things a little bit, to try and create uh, a stronger connection with the brand, to try and sort of connect the, the home exterior experience um, with the brand experience they're going to have uh, in the retail environment. And so we kind of created this thought around, you know, Turkish hospitality. Uh, and bringing in people who could dramatize the goods so, uh, by using them in a way that was reflective of how consumers use the goods, um, but also then using digital in a really sort of uh, honest and simple and clear way, again, reflecting consumer needs. So quite a dramatic step change from a warehouse presentation, all about experience, all about putting the consumer in the shoes of their needs at home, and dramatizing those needs in the store. So they make a connection that says, yes, I want these products, or yes, I can see how this is relevant to my life. But also, it's a really interesting experience for them. Uh, it's, an, it's a great place to go, and people want to go there, and, and it constantly changes as well. Um, so they get new experiences every time they go back. So immersive experiences. Um, and the last sort of st uh, bit on this stage of the presentation is it, talking about the role of the brands. <clears throat> um, one of the things that we do is we look at the consumer journey. Uh, and we look at it online, offline, and in person. We look at it through the physical, human, and digital. And if you break yourself back to, uh, for example, buying buying a mobile phone, and you go through that process, you tend to come out with a very similar journey, um, whether you're uh, a brand in Singapore or whether you're a brand in America. If it's just looking at the experience and relevant journey uh, of buying that phone, you're going to get out, you're going to come out to the same journey. So why do you get different experiences? And different experiences happen when you have different brands and you listen to the brand and the brand values. So I'm going to show you two stores uh, that have been opened very recently, one in America, one in Singapore, for telecom brands. And they opened pretty much the same time, both designed by Fitch, both being put up for uh, the World Retail Congress uh, Store of the Year. Um, but they are dramatically different. And the, the, the reason behind that difference is the brand. So the first one, um, the first one I'm going to show you is Singtel. So Singtel is the, is the leading telecom provider in, in, in Singapore. 
Uh, and they are, as the lead new telecom provider, they're all about making the experience really simple, making the experience um, really sort of friction, what we call frictionless, so smooth and easy. And we did that by designing the most intelligent store. We just basically said, how do you just make this a really simple, easy experience? And the way we looked at it, we, we looked at it again from the consumer perspective, how do we use technology to smooth out all those difficult moments, all those peaks and curves, the queuing, et cetera? And so we used that as our sort of start point to then drive the design. And we worked out all those consumer journeys, all those pain points, how we could, how we could smooth this out before we actually started designing the store itself. Their ambition to be the most intelligent store in the world where you can make, make everything really simple for the consumer, where their customer journey is easy, where digital technology allows you to explore easily by picking up a phone, getting some information about it, picking up another phone next to it and having a direct comparison. Just make the process simple for me. In contrast, we also designed a store for T-Mobile in the States. And in the States, T-Mobile is a challenger brand. Its uh, target audience is the younger audience. It's, uh, it, it tries to connect them to them on a much more emotional level. So where Singtel is make things easy, uh, T-Mobile is, is, is more about reflecting you as a person, a, 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 as the audience. And they know that, that as a challenger brand that's targeting that younger audience, that they're going to alienate or you know, be, there'll be certain rafts of the, of, the, of the demographics that won't buy into them as a brand. But they know that if they can sort of focus in and zero in and own one area, then they can be successful in that area. And that was their brief to us. As a challenger brand, come up with something disruptive, come up with something different and new, and reflective of the audience they want to, to target. And don't worry about the rest.
So, so retail is going through some changes. Um, we would say that, and we would have said that we always done this, but, but I think increasingly we have to focus on the consumer. A lot of the time operations drives how we lay out the store rather than the consumer experience and putting ourselves in the shoes of the consumer. Um, and if you do that, then your retail will create an experience that consumers will want to go to. Um, which all sounds fabulous, uh, and it sounds as if you watch this that there was no issues with retail. But I think we all know that you know, it's going through some challenging times. Um, particularly if you look at some of the big box retailers, the Toys R Us, Bonton, this is where the real sort of uh, struggle is happening within the market. Um, so we're seeing these big box retailers closing down and we're seeing them in shop empty or boarded up spaces in shopping centers, which is a really bad look for the shopping centers. It's a bad look if you want to bring people in. Um, it, it kind of sends out a message that, you know, should I be here? Is this the right place for me? Is this a vibrant place? Um, and yet at the same time, we have this dichotomy. All of these online, online brands, these native digital brands, are opening stores. So the question is, why are they doing it? And we go back to this chart. Does anyone actually know why native digital brands are opening stores? What's their driver? What's their KPI? No? So um, their key driver, digital brands love data. Right? That's, that, is, that is what they, they, they look to get when they open up e-commerce. Uh, they looked for the data, how can I incrementally improve? How can I get information that will actually help me improve my performance, help me target the relevant audience with the right messages? So they look for data. They, it's absolutely vital in the way that they trade. Um, but what they're finding is that the cost per acquisition online is increasing. The cost per acquisition through channels like Instagram is, is going up year after year. So they're, they're actually finding it's becoming quite an expensive way to get people engaged and immersed in their brand. Um, so they're actually looking to physical stores to feed that acquisition and feed that average spend. So what they think is, well, I'll go and set up an online store because I've done that, uh, sorry, an offline store. I'll set up a, a physical store because I've done that online. But actually setting up an online store is really easy. There's lots of templates. There's lots of different software out there that you can, you can tap into. Whereas actually setting up a physical store, that's a challenge. It's heavy on capital expenditure. It's complicated. You have to get store design. You have to get permits, permissions, fixtures, fittings. Um, testing it is hard. And of course, people are asking you to go into you know, five, seven, 10 year leases. It's a really difficult thing to just kind of go, I want to go and test physical stores. Um, the barriers are high, but what if we could lower them? So this is the question that Macerich, which is the, uh, As a digitally native the third brand, largest you've built shopping your owner, operated shopping centers, um, tasked with. Online, you have all the tools to succeed, but your success doesn't have to stop at the screen. Physical retail can fuel your brand's growth, helping you create new and deeper brand experiences. But the path to physical retail requires a lot. You'd typically navigate through a web of complexity to open your store. Finding the right space, negotiating a lease that isn't too long or too costly, getting permits, designers, and contractors, and that's just the opening. Add setting up store operations, security, store analytics, and the complexity multiplies. That's where we come in. Meet Brandbox by Macerich, the all-in-one service and solution helping brands open physical stores. Brandbox makes launching a physical retail experience simple. With short-term leases, a simplified design and build-out process, and help every step of the way, Brandbox helps your brand thrive in both the digital and physical domains. Here's how it works. You're paired with a Brandbox success manager, who gets to know your brand's goals, then guides you through a tailored process. As a Macerich company, Brandbox gives you access to Macerich's best properties, incredibly profitable shopping centers with stellar co-tenancy. We'll fit you with the perfect lease, a time period giving you the runway to test and learn how your brand performs in real life without locking you into something too long-term. We've also made design and build-out easy and cost-effective. We'll connect you with experts to bring your brand to life using Brandbox's flexible fixtures. 
We'll even connect you with partners in technology that can help your store staff up and operate. Finally, we'll make sure you're set to leverage sensors that help you understand foot traffic, conversion, and customer flows, so you can test, optimize, and improve your store experience. Get ready to take your brand beyond the screen with BrandBox, taking digitally native brands from pixel to physical. So, we took 20,000 square foot stores, the ones that are really struggling, ones that are boarded up, <clears throat> and we looked at ways of cutting them up in a very simplistic way with, these, with, the, with a very sort of um, templated design that would allow these, physical, these, these na digital native brands to test physical retail um, over a much shorter period of time. So if we break that down a little bit, we, the, the task Macerich asked us to do was actually work hand in hand with them on this. So we had to sort of put ourselves in the shoes of those digital native brands and how they've run their business to, in order to be able to understand how they would, would be comfortable doing this. So the first thing we did was we created a series of assets online so they could actually begin to learn about um, you know, the world of physical retail uh, and the different aspects that they needed to, to get their head around. And anybody who could go online and find those. And then you could sign up to become a member and you could start planning, defining what your store will do, how it will function, where it will be located. Start really beginning to think it through. We created a series of, of templates and, uh, and um, uh, and tools that would allow them to understand that process. And then this is really where I guess the Fitch bit took over. We designed and we helped build and organize different ways for those brands to uh, express themselves in those spaces. And I will show you a, a film that, 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 that um, it's, it was part of that film, but it's a, it's a bit more detail to, to explain it. And then we helped them to run. So we created a, a, dashboard, a dashboard, a diagnostic tool that allowed them to get all that rich data and learn about you know, when and where and why consumers were coming in, what the footfall was, what the impact of opening that space had onli in online sales in the sort of areas around th those stores. And basically find out for themselves in a cheap or val in a value-driven, cost-effective way whether this physical store for a digital native brand worked as an acquisition tool. And of course, for Mace Ridge, what it meant was they could take some of those big box spaces that were empty, that were making their, their malls look tired and, and a bit run down, or a place where a consumer would be walking past, kind of feeling, well, this, you know, that where's the life here? And give it life. Not only giving it life uh, a space that was closed, but also giving it life in a way that that space would change. It would change every three months or six months or nine months because there'd be a constant sort of feed of new brands coming in. So actually it's giving you more and more reasons to come back. So it's very much a sort of win-win scenario. So as I said, the, the first thing we did was create some, some tools, uh, and sorry, some information online to just begin to help digital native brands get their head around what they needed to do to open a physical store. Because this is the way these guys work. They look online, they, go, they look to learn, they, get to, they look to understand everything that they can before diving in. Then, once they've done that, we created these, these sort of templates. So we created three or four different layouts uh, that they could use that were very easy for us to sort of slot in and out. Uh, and then we had 12 look and feels that we could then layer over the top of that. And you can sort of see it was kind of almost like a uh, almost like a, a sort of Tetris approach. So you could move the walls around, uh, the fixtures could drop in uh, to meet the objectives of, of the stores. Um, um, and it allowed them to test different, different approaches. So, you know, as you can, as you can see, there's, there's different sort of layouts. You can see there's one that's about to come up, which is a completely different size as well. And all of that was very easy for them to slot in, and they could then dress with sort of permanent or, or with semi permanent graphics and, and give it a different look and feel. So if they took it for three months and they felt it was working, but they wanted a bigger store, they could expand it out. <coughs> if they wanted a smaller store, they can contract it. Or if it didn't work for them, they could exit. What we also found is that it informed their, or it informed for Mace Rich, their approach to leasing. So they knew how successful, they got the data, they knew how successful these stores were. So they could then go embark on a conversation around leasing for a permanent store if that's what the brand was interested in. 
And rather than just comparing it to you know, stores around it, what they were leased for, they could actually start to link in their leases with the performance of these stores. So it actually it began to change the way they, they viewed, which is not something they expected to do. It began to change the way they viewed and thought of their leasing strategy. So um, the first uh, brand box opened in November 2018 in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. And you can sort of see the brands up there. Uh, so those brands were, I'll have a list of them here. Uh, Winky Lux, a cosmetics brand, uh, whose pure objective was to increase their Instagram followers. So they weren't worried about selling out of this store. They just wanted to increase their Instagram followers because that was their main driver of their business. Increase Instagram followers, people would then buy. Uh, so their KPI was get more followers, uh, and that helps the cost per acquisition. Uh, Nadam was an affordable cashmere brand. Urban Stores is a gifting, uh, a gifting store for flowers and gifts. Nectar was a, a bedding store, again, uh, an online store. That they, get, they just wanted people to come in and physically touch the product because one of the, feed, the feedback they had was people were tempted by their, by their product, but they didn't trust it because they didn't know it and they didn't have enough advocates around. So they wanted to get some advocates and get people to feel comfortable with the brand before they commit to it. The other interesting thing we didn't expect to happen is that we got a couple of brands who were used to going into physical store who decided they wanted to come and test this as well. So DKNY decided they wanted to test a store that was outside of department stores. So uh, you can see, up, I've got my pointer up here, DKNY trying, trialing it as well. Um, so uh, that was about a year ago. The two or three of those have, have swapped out. Uh, a couple have gone into sort of permanent leases. Uh, and Mace which are opening uh, new locations in California and uh, Scottsdale, opening uh, um, new examples of this brand box approach, um, allowing digital native brands to test in a way that's a little bit more permanent than a pop-up and a little closer to a permanent store, but in a way that means they don't have to commit to heavy capex they don't have to commit to long leases. And they can find out, does physical retail work for them? Does it give them that halo effect? So when thinking about the future of retailers, we believe there are things that you need to do which are be driven by consumer needs. Right? Put, your, put, your shoe, put, put yourself in the shoes of the consumer and the consumer mind states. Then deliver the right mix of physical, human, and digital touch points. Don't get run away with digital for digital sake. If it's not meeting a human need, if it doesn't meet a purpose, if it doesn't have a, a purpose that meets a human need, then digital is just digital for technology's sake. Fundamentally, we are human and we have needs, and, we have to and, and as retailers, we have to deliver against those needs to give them a compelling experience. Be an experience that delivers against the brand promise, Right, so make sure you understand your brand, make sure that you reflect your brand, and make sure that you're, you're a mirror of that brand. Um, and start to think like online retailers. We, we think that the lessons that we're learning from digital native brands going into retail is going to change the way we think as retailers, as core retailers who've gone into their world. We need to start looking at them and what they're doing coming into world, our world and how they're learning about our world and how they're thinking about it in different ways. How they're looking at it as a halo effect, not just cost per sales. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? No? Okay.
Hello. Good afternoon. I'm David. Nice to be here with you. So we're going to make this an interactive conversation, maybe even a workshop, on what innovation means. So I am um, a journalist who spent a lot of time working with tech entrepreneurs. I set up Wired magazine in the UK, which is um, the publication that looks at where the world is going, not just in tech and science, but design and business models and human behavior. And I have just written um, a book, which has a rude word in the title, which looks at what real innovation is inside successful existing businesses. There's a lot of resources being wasted in fake innovation, in the theater of innovation, in creating a head of innovation in the organization or a little startup lab that's not leading to any future value. Um, so I went to 20 countries to find successful organizations, leaderships that were transforming in ways that were protecting those businesses for the future. Um, there's a chapter in here about the UAE and the obsession here with understanding where future opportunities were going, how tech would enable those future businesses. Um, so tomorrow I'm doing a keynote on what this means in particularly for retail, but I thought today it might be useful because I am constantly with the startups in the tech clusters. Um, in the last week, I've been with 50 health tech people in Iceland, um, with marketing tech people in Athens. Um, I've been in too many airplanes in Poland, um, and I can share maybe some of how they're thinking um, because there's something very interesting happening at the moment. A lot of the exponential technologies, not just um, computer processing, but artificial intelligence, new forms of um, solar energy, new ways to process genomic information, um, those curves are creating fewer and fewer barriers to entry. Prices are collapsing. If you are now a couple of kids in a bedroom in Bangkok, you can create a new kind of heart monitoring device. Um, and you're going to hear a lot in the next couple of days about the impact of machine intelligence and blockchains and quantum computing. My starting point is um, it's less about what one of these technologies will do in the short term to your business. It doesn't really matter if augmented reality is going to be another way for clients to discover products. It doesn't really matter um, which kind of sensor unit you have to track people's movements. What matters is that you're prepared for what's coming next because none of us knows precisely how the consumer is going to respond to a new technology, a growth technology. Um, so it's about having the mindset that allows you to, first of all, attract the talent, secondly, the diversity of thinking, and thirdly, the prototype and iterate mindset that the best startups have. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about what I discovered in the quest for proper non-bullshit innovation, um, and then I'd love to have a conversation where we talk about some of the challenges you're facing and some of your concerns about tech, but also about the mindset of innovation. So the starting point is if you're making profits, especially if you're a listed company, quarter by quarter, it's really not easy to shift directions because in five years your business model is going to be irrelevant. It's Clayton Christensen called the innovator's dilemma. And you can't rest. The number of companies and the length of time in um, the public listed markets, um, well, that's changing. Your time as a listed company is contracting because there are so many new paradigm shifts coming along. So how do you make your business adaptable, agile, and bold enough to look where the puck is going. One of the key ways that this is happening in some of the strongest 
games companies, manufacturing companies, finance companies, is by um, getting rid of this old model of the hierarchy where somebody at the top makes the decisions. Because in the new model, what's happening at the bottom, what's happening on the streets, monitoring customer behavior, that's increasingly important. So how do you defer this power of thinking through where the business should go to the people lower down the pyramid? And there are examples of very fast growth companies in gaming, in consulting engineering, that are benefiting from losing this hierarchical approach. Um, there's a games company in Finland called Supercell that's probably the most successful in Europe. And the boss, Ilka Pananen, talks about wanting to be the world's least powerful CEO because it's all about attracting amazing people and then giving them space to do what they do best in a way that motivates them. The battle now is for talent. There's a consulting engineering firm in London that helped build the Burj Al Khalifa, a whole bunch of tunnels, bridges, almost impossible tall buildings. It's called Arup. 15,000 consulting engineers around the world, but it's based in London. And unusually, it's owned by the staff. The company is owned by a trust, and everybody who works there has a stake in the company. I talked to the chairman who says, I don't really have any decisions. It's not about me. All we have to do is make sure that the 20-somethings want to work here and then let them decide how they work. And there was an example of a project that everybody said was impossible that they managed to solve because the 20-somethings saw it as an intellectual challenge. The hotel in London, Claridge's, for 10 years wanted to build five basement levels. And for 10 years, every engineering, every building firm said, you can't do it whilst keeping the hotel open. They didn't want to close the hotel because they didn't want to lose the loyalty of the VIP guests. So it became known as the impossible basement project because there was so much structural building that would have needed to have been done. And then they called in Arup for one final look. And some people from Arup, where the people lower down get to decide what they work on, they got excited about it. They took it on. They thought, we will work together to find a solution. And in fact, they found a solution by bringing in a bunch of Irish miners who hand dug 30 meter deep trenches, 62 of them, and they filled them with concrete and then supported the existing hotel on top as they continued to tunnel. And they finished in February this year the five basement floors only because the talent gave that company the flexibility of thinking. It wasn't about the boss. So if talent and empowering it is key, there's also the importance of getting diverse mindsets so that you're not stuck in a very fixed way of thinking. And a lot of the strongest of the startups don't just have engineers or engineers and designers. They bring in people from different backgrounds, different demographics, people who think in ways that will challenge each other. I went for the book to the Moonshot Lab that Google Alphabet operates in Mountain View. This is um, X. They've come up with Waymo, the autonomous car business. They've come up with Loon, a drone delivery business. They've come up with, no, Wing is the drone business. Loon is the stratosphere level balloons that deliver internet connectivity to places that you can't reach with conventional tech. And each of these businesses is a multi-billion dollar business. Um, Waymo may be a hundred billion dollars at some stage. Um, and they're very careful inside X to enable what they call cognitive diversity. 
you don't just want people who are the obvious people to solve a problem. You want to bring in a classically trained concert pianist or a former ballerina or somebody who's obsessed with origami. Because when different people around a table are confronting a challenge, they'll surprise each other and they'll offer answers that aren't part of the official way of thinking. There was um, a woman there who was working in marketing called Kathy Hannon. She was obsessed with sustainable fuels. And she'd read a paper by a professor that suggested, in theory, you could take seawater and you could take the carbon and the hydrogen out of it and combine them to make a carbon neutral fuel. And so she goes to the bosses and says, I'd like to do a bit of work on this project. And as well as cognitive diversity, they also have a culture at X of what they call psychological safety. If you propose an outrageous idea, people don't laugh at you. They give you space, they listen to you, they consider it. She proposed this idea, and then they gave her a small amount of money and another person to work with just to test the science. And they said, we'll give you KPIs, we'll give you metrics. If you meet one of the metrics, we'll give you a bit more. And they're very measurement-based. That keeps them honest. So at the beginning of a project, you have to agree a metric at which you will kill the project. It's called a, a kill criterion. And for Kathy Hannon, the kill criterion was, well, if we can't make the fuel at the same price as petrol at the US gas stations, then we'll kill the project. At first, she hires the professor who wrote the paper, builds a little team, experiments, finds that the science works. They create this fuel, having taken the carbon and hydrogen from the seawater. It's very expensive. It's about $1,000 per gallon equivalent. But they keep researching. And as they meet more targets, they get more resources. The team gets bigger. They worked on this for two years. And they took the price down to $100 a gallon, to $50, to $15, to $10. And then she goes to the boss and says, it's going to take longer and cost more to get to $4, $5. So we're going to kill the project. That was the metric I promised, so we're going to have to stick with it. And the boss was surprised, but he gave her and the whole team a cash bonus because they'd kept to the principle, and that's how X works. So diverse ways of thinking, accepting that innovation is about ignoring the rules as you're entering a new world. And I guess a third thing I noticed in all sorts of businesses, in all sorts of sectors, is they weren't scared of an emerging technology. They were willing to invest just enough to learn how it could help them. They were prepared to experiment. There's a fertilizer company in Norway that's, I think, the world's second biggest provider of fertilizer. It's 100 years old. It's called Yara. And it began with the scientist who managed to take nitrogen from the air, turn it into a fertilizer. Um, and they had a particular problem they needed to solve. To get the fertilizer from the factory in Norway to the port for export, they were using 40,000 diesel trucks every year. And they couldn't get the drivers. They didn't want to do the job. It was expensive, and it was also not very sustainable. So about three years ago, the board agreed an experiment. They had heard about autonomous travel. And they thought, why don't we put $40 million into a project to build the world's first autonomous electric cargo ship? They get some of the best engineers working on it, including the company that designs the electronics for cruise missiles. 
They're building it at the moment in Romania. The regulation isn't quite fast enough for what the tech enables. But what was interesting is about two years ago, they did a demonstration of a prototype in the water in Oslo. It got quite a lot of press coverage. And then lots of other Scandinavian companies call them up and say, hey, we have a similar problem. Could we pay you to use your autonomous electric cargo ship? And they realize because they were early in a tech, they're developing the IP. They're proving something that nobody else has worked on. They've created new future-facing value that at some stage could be worth billions. There's um, a company in Hong Kong that makes saucepans. It's one of the world's biggest manufacturers of pots and pans. It's called Maya. Um, you won't know the brand because they mostly work with retail chains, so your department store will sell the Maya saucepan under their own name. And it was started in 1961 by a man who's now a billionaire called Stanley Cheng. And Stanley's son, Vincent, who's in his 30s, who's always online, said, Dad, you know the internet's coming for the kitchen too. There's this thing called connected cooking, where your oven is online and downloads recipes. We're going to become irrelevant unless we start experimenting with the tech. So Stanley gives Vincent a little bit of money, a barn in Napa Valley in California, and the instructions go experiment with what connected cooking could mean for us. So Vincent starts this startup inside the big company, and he hires a bunch of Michelin-starred chefs in this barn in Napa Valley. They make recipes, they film the recipes in an app, and then they connect the app to a new kind of cooking pot that the company has built that has a temperature sensor in the middle of the metal and that uses conductive heating that also connects to the iPad app so that when you're following the recipes on the app, the signal goes directly to the frying pan and controls the heat in a very precise way for just the right number of seconds to the exact degree. And the idea is you can cook alongside the Michelin-starred chefs when you're going through their recipes. And they're aiming at creating a subscription model so that anybody can be a Michelin chef. It's going to be like a Netflix of cooking. You will subscribe every month, and you will get 40 or 50 recipes. But they will be precise enough to allow you to cook as well as the best chefs. I don't know if it's going to save this company that bends aluminum into pans, but I asked Stanley, the billionaire founder, how important he thinks this is going to be. And he said, look, it's either going to be worth nothing or it's going to be worth a billion dollars. But if we don't play, we're going to be irrelevant. We're going to be worth nothing. So when all these emerging technologies are going to affect where people spend, how people spend, what retail is, I'm not going to tell you that blockchain or near-frequency communication or QR codes or AR or VR are the solution in a shopping mall. But I do think you need a culture in the organization that is playing, that is looking for things that may not have a short-term revenue return. Because unless you play, you're going to get left behind where the customer is. And unless your team feels free to experiment and to follow their instinct, you're going to be disadvantaged. And it's hitting every single world. It's hitting traditional offline worlds like manufacturing, but it's also hitting now the digital worlds. The phone company in Taiwan, HTC, that made the first Google phone, it made um, one of the first portable VR devices, the HTC Vive. Um, they have gone through a few near-death experiences lately. They weren't competing against the big Samsungs, the um, Huawei's, the Apples. They're now experimenting 
by bringing in different members of the family to rethink what a phone is by having that diversity in the company. Phil Chen, whose aunt set up HTC, is now running a unit that sees the phone not simply as a way to message, as a way to consume video, as a way even to make calls. He thinks we're in an increasingly decentralized network. There are going to be blockchains. We don't quite know what they're going to be, but it's going to be more than cryptocurrency. Why don't we design a new kind of handset that is your personal access point to this decentralized network? It's your node on the network. So in December, they launched something called the Exodus phone, which is the first mainstream phone that allows you to secure your identity in the phone in a way that's protected. And when you can secure your identity, not only can you store your cryptocurrency there, but it gets more interesting. You can let other organizations on the network give you micro payments for using your data, for using the sensors in your phone. And the vision is, it's early in the journey, you will be able to use the device maybe to get some small payments from advertisers for sharing in detail your preference and for letting the network access unused processing power or storage on your device or maybe letting companies access the sensors like the gyro in your device. Again, it's challenging thinking I can't tell you this is going to be a big success, but if HTC doesn't start exploring, it's risking getting left behind. And I'll give you a fourth way of creating a culture of innovation inside a profitable, existing, successful business. Have a small team empowered to be pirates inside the organization. I don't mean to try and kill processes or destabilize the company culture. I mean people who, with backing from the very top, can go and solve tech problems without having to go through committees, without having to wait a long time for agreement. There's a really powerful example in Washington, D.C., in the Pentagon. So the U.S. Department of Defense was hitting a wall. It was delivering procurement projects over budget, too late, and they weren't necessarily what the soldiers on the front line needed. But ISIS is like a startup. It can hack things together. It put a DJI drone into the air with a grenade on, and it goes over the border in Iraq, and it causes problems. Now, if you're the Pentagon and you've asked Lockheed Martin to design a way to solve this, it's going to take you two years. It's not going to work. They needed to think more like a startup, but the Pentagon represents three million people in this government department, and it's a bureaucracy that is very slow. So about three years ago, they hired a guy from startups who doesn't care about the rules. He swears a lot. He wears a hoodie that says, hack the Pentagon. And they gave him an office, and they said, recruit some other people from startups. They don't have to have a career here. They can stay here for six months or one year. But we want people who can just find a problem, use tech to solve it. They called the unit Defense Digital Service, but they themselves know it as the Rebel Alliance because they see themselves fighting the dominant culture to get stuff done. And on their door, it even has Rebel Alliance as their identity. And they knew that the bureaucracy wasn't solving some basic problems like securing the public-facing websites. They had never done a bug bounty competition which the big tech companies always use. You pay friendly hackers 
if they can spot vulnerabilities in your networks. They were told it was illegal, but somehow they managed to get permission to do the first bug bounty competition where they got friendly hackers finding vulnerability in defense.gov because they didn't want hostile forces taking over. Within 10 minutes, they found the first vulnerabilities. That is now the norm. It's the rule across all US government websites now. You must have these competitions. They went, a small team of them, to the front line in the Middle East to work with soldiers on the ground to devise radio signal jammers so that the drones with the grenades would no longer come over the front line, and they solved that problem. So I tell you this because they weren't part of the dominant culture, but they gradually earned the respect of the dominant culture because they got stuff done. They solved the problem. So if you're a 2,000, a 5,000, a 10,000 person operation, how do you make sure that you are not getting stuck in one way of thinking, that you are allowing your culture to innovate, to use tech, to understand how behavior is changing to solve those problems. Give yourself space for a little unit. And also, find ways, as I said, to look for future-facing tech, even if there's no short-term economic revenue, because you never know what you will discover. There's a software company called Autodesk that became very successful 30 years ago when it made AutoCAD, software that architects and designers use. But that was a different era. That was the first years of the desktop computer. What happens to the company Autodesk when desktop computers mean a lot less than the cloud, than artificial intelligence? How does it stay relevant? To its credit, Autodesk has always put a high proportion of its budget into playing, into giving its team space to explore without needing to justify in the short term a product. They have a pier in San Francisco full of robots and 3D printers and artists on paid fellowships and they use it a w as a way of understanding how people increasingly want to use software in different ways. And about three years ago, they were playing to see how if a designer is working on, let's say, an airplane seat, what if you allowed artificial intelligence to work alongside them and suggest variations of what they were doing? What if the designer could say, my aeroplane seat must be no more heavy than 4.7 kilograms. I want it made out of these materials. I want it no less than this wide. Those constraints are used by the AI to suggest hundreds, maybe thousands, of different ways of making this work in real time. It was an experiment. They called it generative design, because just like nature generates in Darwinism, new versions of a flower or an animal. The system was generating new ways to build whatever the designer was building. So this was blue sky thinking. The CTO, the chief technology officer of Autodesk, called it looking for your blind spots. They quickly realized that this could be the tech that saves Autodesk. Because if you can make the human designers work better, easier, with more choices because of the AI, people are going to buy your software. So last year, they started releasing products with generative design inside the products, and they're selling extremely well. So I make the point because it's a product they didn't look for in terms of generating revenue that is going to end up generating large amounts of revenue. So I guess in my exploration of how banks, media companies, industrial companies, all sorts of organizations were able to generate 
new business lines, future-facing revenue, I thought hard about what innovation actually is and what it isn't. And it's not the cool new toy. Just because there are emerging technologies, just because you and I can go and design a new use for a drone or give somebody a virtual reality experience doesn't mean that's going to create future-facing business. Innovation isn't product. It's thinking through what your market wants at a time when the tools are changing, at a time when their behavior is changing. And it's really about how you can create an organization, a culture, where you're prepared to challenge how you've always assumed the business should work. How you can attract the talent that's going to build products and services in new directions, in ways that don't need somebody at the top saying, this is what I want you to do. Innovation is about accepting the reality, which is the barriers to entry are collapsing, and your competition is everywhere. And in retail, as we've seen, the barrier to entry of having the physical space is challenged by changing behavior, where people are touching this thing and expecting magic to happen and be delivered as soon as possible, because that's what they want. Because if you're in retail, your new reality is your customers are being trained by these networks that their services should be ultra-personalized. There should be no friction. They should not have to even stand in line to pay. They're being trained that the smart machine, the artificial intelligence, will customize a product for them and deliver it to them and understand their emotional response. Your customers are being told that whoever has paid for the advertisement is not necessarily the authority because the 23-year-old working from her bedroom on Instagram is suddenly the influencer who is the authority. So with these new realities, I think you have to engage with them. You can't ignore them. You can't look for backward-facing business models when things are moving so quickly that Chanel, Dior are being challenged by Kylie Cosmetics run by the youngest billionaire in the world. She has no team. She has about six people, Kylie. She outsources the manufacturing of her cosmetics. She outsources the um, shipping and the financial processing to a company called Shopify. Her mum does her PR. And Kylie goes online and acts as the marketing channel. So the rules have changed. So I guess people are always going to want to buy, and they're always going to want the experience of going to a place to buy. But you don't, I don't know where this is going to take us in five years. All we know is there will be change, and the world will never move this slowly again, and we'll need to prepare our internal cultures to face this. So I'm going to kind of stop there um, and invite you to be part of a, a wider conversation about the challenges you're facing, both in terms of technology and this mystical thing called innovation. I'd love to hear some of the things that you've been trying that have been working, because I think other people in here can learn from that. Um, and you know, we, could, we could turn this into more of a workshop, more of a discussion. Um, but I think you can learn from what is hitting other sectors, from the car industry to the communications industry to the food industry. Because in each of these sectors, the same accelerating trends are happening. 
if you are in agriculture, you know, what is meat now? Meat now doesn't happen to come from an animal because there are multi-billion dollar companies making meat out of plants and the consumers are responding. If you are in media, you know, what is your business model? Because advertising is no longer the subsidy that sustains you. How do you create new value channels? Um, and I guess if you are in retail, you could probably steal some ideas from what has been happening in other worlds. I'm amazed that a tech company that was renting out DVDs just a couple of years ago is now spending this year $15 billion commissioning films and TV programs. This is Netflix. It's found a radically innovative way to get people to pay for this in the subscription model. It's changed that behavior. It was there at the time the customer was willing to change that behavior. What does that mean for the conventional TV industry? It means they can't relax. They have to rethink what they are. So with that, I would welcome anybody to ask a question, to share an experience. There are some microphones going around. Um, just raise a hand and then tell us who you are and where you're from, and we will keep the conversation going. Uh, hi, David. This is Nick. Uh, we're a family office based in Dubai, and we invest a lot into technology over in uh, Asia, uh, primarily a lot in India. A uh, couple of things that I would like to share uh, what we've uh, noticed in, in, in your conversations as well. I, uh, very impressive in terms of uh, what you've been doing and traveling around the world and uh, got to learn some new things today. But in, I focus a lot on the financial side of things, which is fintech. And uh, that, uh, I guess, technology has really changed the game there. Uh, the cost of loans has gone, dropped substantially, cost of servicing it. So the SME segment, the consumer loan business is fantastic today. And so something that technology has really changed across, which is artificial intelligence, machine learning, a little bit less, less of the fluff, but there's a lot of good stuff that's going on now. So that's one thing where technology has really made a huge difference in a place like India. The payment gateways in India are fantastic. I think one of the best in the world today uh, by far, uh, and everybody's known about them. So that's something that we've noticed. But in the retail side of things, and uh, just looking at all the numbers across in, uh, in India, primarily, in, and I haven't seen a lot of... Uh, profitability come out from uh, some of the stuff. So like even Amazon and all these. So they've been trying new stuff, but uh, it still looks like it's the same old way of doing e-commerce, <laughs> which the, so none of your uh, you know, futuristic stuff has yet taken shape in, uh, in, a, in a consumer quite, a, I think the consumer in India is quite uh, advanced when it comes to this, but the technology hasn't really caught up. So even if you're at Amazon in India today, you're still not got some, some really high-tech stuff of shopping around or, or any of the e-commerce plays. Any reason why you would think that, that, that uh, some, something like that hasn't caught up? So I don't know if you heard the question. Um, the technology is advancing, but maybe the profitability isn't advancing, and particularly in markets like India. Um, we're going through one of these transitions in the expectations of the investment world. So for the last eight years, profitability has been really unpopular. If you were a startup that was profitable, it would kind of lower your valuation because it was growth at all costs. It was this land grab. It was, if you could be Kareem and kill the local competition, then you would have a long-term value. If you could be the retailer, the souk, the Amazon, and dominate your market, sustain losses until you can grow, grow, grow. And we're at an inflection point, and that's changing. And increasingly, I'm seeing new calls for financial discipline hitting a lot of these big companies. We've even seen it in SoftBank's Vision Fund. They invested in a fantasy company called WeWork that didn't have any intrinsic value, but had a charismatic founder. And Massa of SoftBank kept telling him, grow, 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 we'll keep feeding, until everything came crushing down lately. 
And now SoftBank is going to its other portfolio companies in all sorts of sectors, in car leasing, in dog walking, in whatever, and saying, okay, we need a reality check. You need to head towards profitability. Um, Amazon finally got to profitability fairly recently, even though it's still investing in new types of business. Um, and it was one of the few that reached market dominance without depending on the eternal funding machine. So I think there is a lot of liquidity out there. There's a lot of money, not all of it smart money, going to huge experiments in tech, huge experiments in e-commerce. The mood can change very quickly. In media, there were a bunch of digitally native media companies that grew in the last four years. There were multi-billion dollar companies like Vice and you know, Buzzfeed. There were very valuable companies like um, Mick, um, Mashable, and one by one, reality has hit them and they've either gone or been marked right down. So I think just because the liquidity was there doesn't mean it's going to stay there. And discipline for any business has to define what they do. India is a slightly unusual market in there is a very fast emerging middle class and it's still on that journey. And I see places like Nigeria going through the same process. Um, and that's being accelerated by um, Reliance and other companies kind of lowering the cost of bandwidth. Um, it means that there are um, media companies that are developing huge audiences for streaming because people can now afford access. What I suspect will happen is the consumption, the purchasing habits will follow this, but it's it's a relatively early part of that journey. The challenges in a lot of the Indian markets um, are around, first of all, logistics and then payments. But aren't problems wonderful things for entrepreneurs to try and solve? You know, I used to have to go to the bank to get foreign currency five years ago. Now I use a couple of apps, TransferWise, Revolut, I touch a button, I get the interbank exchange, everything works. So very quickly, the people who push the limits change the expectations. If you find the entrepreneur in India who you think is gonna win, then let me know so we'll both invest. What I love about this place is because it's such a small local market, the really impressive entrepreneurs here, and I've personally invested in one or two of them, um, they go global from the start. Maybe they'll start with the Middle East, they'll go Saudi, they'll go wider in Asia, but very quickly they're planning their international rollout. And that is very exciting. Hello, tell us who you are. I am Avi uh, from Istanbul, Turkey. And uh, the difference in our names is that you have two more Ds than my name. So my name is in the middle of your name. So if Hello, I can Abby. add up for your digital disruption that mm -hmm. you are uh, telling us today, uh, and I believe I am older than you. So I belong to the previous generation and you are representing today with your excellent uh, presentation uh, regarding the forthcoming uh, changes. Rather than a question, I would like to you know, uh, give a comment if I may, because I've been working uh, as a shopping center consultant for 26 years. And hopefully, if I can make the advertisement Tuesday morning, we will be speaking on the outlet malls, which is another format of uh, the transformation in our industry. Uh, what I would like to add is that despite all the possibilities, all the uh, conveniences the e-commerce is introducing to our lives, uh, it is still uh, the social, and as in the pres previous presentation of Fitch, uh, that the uh, gathering of people I mean, from the old times, because the souks here are still alive. Uh, when we are trying to imitate or copy into the modernity, sometimes it's not working, as it was in the case in Dubai Mall. So they had to make some conversions. Uh, I do believe that 
the trend and tendency would go more towards uh, mixed use developments, putting many things together, especially with the sharing economy that we are facing nowadays. So uh, the mixed use, uh, including inclusion of all the components, not only for shopping, but also working, uh, enjoying, entertaining, eating, dining. So uh, even if you can order the food by uh, online to your house, but when you are trying to meet friends, then you will come again to our places, which are the gathering places from the old time agoras, the you know, uh, bazaars uh, to the modern shopping centers. So I, how do you evaluate, let me just add a question to it, uh, the inclusion of all the uh, culture, arts, uh, dining, uh, which is based on the experience uh, the visitors uh, would be facing by coming to our places. Because today's uh, challenges, especially on the deliveries, is uh, pushing us more and more into the omni-channel side so that the click and collect might become the solution uh, of the forthcoming, overcoming the challenges of the logistics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Avi. That was an important observation. Um, people are hungry for community, for connecting with other people, and they need physical places to do this. And I think in many cultures, especially in the West, there is a growing epidemic of loneliness, and we are increasingly isolated, even behind our screens that claim to be social networks. Um, people will pay disproportionate amounts to share a space with other people. Starbucks growth was as the new space that wasn't home, that wasn't work. The growth of co-working, whether or not you buy into the business model of WeWork, and it's huge growth, is because people want to go to a place where they may meet people who can help them, who can think differently. And as I said, diverse thinking helps you prepare for the future. And why, if you're a finance person, would you not want to be in a co-working space with a hardware person, with a design person? The challenge, I think, for the physical mall and um, other kinds of retail establishments um, is many of them had a very, very successful long-term business model they didn't need to challenge. So the thinking was all about how to optimize shelf display, how to optimize growth yields, and the thinking wasn't about how the human being is experiencing this physical space, what the customer journey was. Who were the people? What was in their mind? What were their domestic challenges? And I think you need to take the whole person. You need to have ethnographers as well as retail specialists. You need um, people who design experiences. And I think you need to understand how, if you are a 16-year-old, you want to meet friends in a safe space. If you are a um, 40-year-old mother of teenagers, you need a place that is socially um, compatible with um, catching up with your friends. So what are the enhanced services that people will pay for? Um, so we hear this word retailtainment. It's partly you will pay for a wider experience than simply shopping. Um, but I'm also seeing, and you see on some of the displays there, it's also creating a new kind of space that is a compelling experience in itself. So I'm from London, where there's been a huge, one of the biggest retail um, and office developments in Europe at King's Cross, at St. Pancras. It was a drug dealer, prostitute infested area 15 years ago. Now it's the place people are actively choosing to go and spend um, a weekend because um, there's the canal that's been renovated that touches the old railway sheds that now have design stores. There are, yep, there are fountains that are experiences in themselves. And I think I've seen a lot in Dubai that does that. Um, you're not selling access to retail, you're selling both experiences 
and a sense of self. And what do we want as human beings? We want some sense of enhanced status. We want the opportunity, the possibility, the thrill of meeting other people. And we want um, to feel we're doing the cool stuff. And it's an amazing opportunity for people who have a physical space, such as a mall, to start thinking in a very different way. How do we program this space so people can come here and feel they're doing the cool stuff? And that may mean giving enormous power to guest curators. You know, what happens if you give artists control for a month? What happens if you give esports people a space because that's a huge growth pastime? I think it means, like in my cognitive diversity remarks, um, bringing in people on an advisory board who don't think like the people who have been running them all for the last 20 years. I have three children, and I'm always thinking, what physical location can I take them to that won't get them moaning, that will create excitement? You have this perfect opportunity. Is there another microphone with somebody to either share a point? David, David McAdam. Hello, here. David. I have a question for you. Yes. You're a consumer, you have three children, you live in London, fairly connected place. You are out in the rest of the world looking at things going on. What would make you a more compelling shopper yourself? What could we do for you that would make you a happier shopper? So I sit in between different worlds. So I'm an investor in about 60 tech companies. I'm constantly traveling to the local tech clusters to understand how they're thinking. Um, but I'm also meeting people like you who are trying to navigate these very successful businesses through these digital changes. Um, so if I take how the startup people are thinking, they know that the customer will not tolerate friction. The retail experience has to be as simple as possible. Standing in line doesn't work anymore. Not having something in stock when you expect it just kills the love. So when I want to spend a chunk of, you know, well, carefully earned money on the product, how can you delight me and not just treat me as a customer, but I'm happy for you to know a bit more about me if it creates a sense of concierge experience. You can learn from the hospitality industry. You know, the hotel will know if you are a regular client. They will know how you like your room set up. They will give you complimentary drinks that you have in the past ordered. And it creates that emotional bond. So what are you going to do that's going to create an emotional connection with me and reassure me that I can, in a friction-free way, access your products on my terms without having delays. But also, how can you turn it into an experience that delights me in a way that surprises me? How can you turn it into an adventure? So I'm a bit obsessed with adventure because I think too much of our world is being commodified. It increasingly doesn't matter what devices you use to access the network because they're all doing the same thing. Um, it doesn't matter what car you get in to get to the airport, to your office, because increasingly you're using a car service and you're not thinking is this going to be a Mercedes or a BMW. So there's commodification happening in services and infrastructure. You will notice the adventure, the experience. You will notice a particular, so I was in a taxi in an Uber um, in Greece last week, and the driver turned around and gave me some Turkish delight that his wife had made. And 
That's never happened to me before. You know, I didn't eat them because <laughs> it's a strange to give me sweets, but it made me feel a warmth to him, and it made me part of his story and his family, and it started conversations. And, you know, he gets a nice tip on the app, and he gets a nice rating, and I think better about the service that provided me with that car. So I think we need to return to basic human needs, the Maslow's hierarchy, the emotional needs. What gives me self-expression? What takes me to a place I wasn't expecting to go? What makes me excited that you're giving me an adventure, not selling me a product? There's a gentleman with an experience. Can we get a microphone here? Thank you. Tell us who you are. Hi, how are you? I'm George Rajdi from Bujnar Mall, part of Jamaan Bajan Group. A lot of things that you mentioned really touch home because uh, me as a consumer, I also look at the added value approach. So if I'm buying a product, what comes with the product that makes me choose you rather over a competition? And one funny thing happened that you know, we all drink coffee, right? And, you know, I used to go to a particular coffee shop place uh, on a regular basis. And then I started, um, you know, a bakery opened up next to where I live. And, you know, I used to buy particular items from there. And they had a coffee shop bar that they integrated as part of the bakery. And this is extremely unorthodox, right? You only see a bakery to buy your bakery items, your pastry, and that's it. So started having a discussion. And it turns out that the guy is a barista. And I started asking, what are all these coffee beans that are on the table? And he started explaining that this is from Ethiopia, this is from uh, Colombia, this is from Jamaica. And he started educating me in the sense that every coffee in every region where it comes from has a different flavor. And that was extremely interesting because it opened up my world in the sense that coffee is more than just Nescafe, mm. right? Coffee is more about how it's brewed, where mm. it's sourced, and that added a very positive experience. And from that on, whenever I go to a coffee shop place, I always ask them, where do you source your coffee from? What's the brew, if I like it, right? And you're prepared to pay more exactly. because it has a story attached. And one, one interesting tidbit about Starbucks, you know, I never used to go to Starbucks because when I drink their coffee, it's always extremely bitter. And I never understood why. And funnily enough, serendipity, right? Uh, one of the projects I was working on had a Starbucks inside. So I started working in the Starbucks because it's the mall I'm working in. And slowly, slowly, because of that past experience, I started asking questions like, do you have medium roast? Hmm. Do you have other flavors? And then they said, yeah, we do. Right, so then I started a medium roast, Colombian. I said, great, it's my favorite, right? And because of that experience of having to work in that mall with the only coffee shop being Starbucks, I was forced to basically be exposed to Starbucks mm -hmm. and I saw an experience that I never thought was there to the extent that now whenever I do go to a Starbucks, I always have a standard order that I do order, which is a medium roast grande, yeah, Americano with, uh, you know, sparkling water with lemon and half glass of venti cup with ice. And the funny thing is, the first time I did that order, okay, they absorbed it. And the second time I came, not expecting, they uh, remembered my order. You know, uh, uh, grande, Americano, medium roast. The lady here is bringing you some coffee. <laughs> <laughs> right? So um, what I'm trying to say is that it, what, what you're saying completely resonates uh, with me. Now, my question is, this is a type of culture where you as a consumer, right, you are trying to look to maximize the value of the money that you're spending. And you know now that it's not only about uh, the product, it's about the experience with the product. So how can you know, malls and retailers adapt to a, uh, or encourage consumers to think in that track, because many consumers today, they're still stuck in that, you know, waiting in line, yeah. picking up, you know, the items, and they're not exposed 
to that, uh, you know, different types of, you know, retail environments, so they don't know what they're missing out on. So do you think that this is an opportunity for shopping centers to capitalize on exposing consumers to unique experiences so that they can capture customer loyalty in a way that, given how the market is in this region still is, that this could be an, you know, an opportunity that you know, many people are missing out on? This is a brilliant observation um, because we will pay extra for decommodification. So if you think about the world of coffee, 20 years ago, a couple of spoonfuls of freeze-dried coffee served in a restaurant was fine. Now, the Nespresso machine has changed that experience. And it's also decommodified the public understanding of what coffee is. And I think the mall, as a metaphor, could learn from the Nespresso machine, which, you know, it's a functional unit. It does what you expect. But they've built an ecosystem alongside it. It's one of the smartest product innovations from a giant Swiss corporate that you've ever seen. Um, they've created a loyalty model involving subscription, involving you become part of a relationship with them, and they will recycle what you have thrown away. It's created an education stream in that they will guide you to ways to personalize your tastes through your journey through that. And it's created a hierarchy of um, increasingly precious, expensive experiences. And it's done it through the designed experience. So how can my experience in the shopping mall make me feel I'm gaining the pleasure of the thought through designed experience. I'm gaining the education in that I'm learning something. I'm gaining the human contact from the specialists who have a passion and who are obsessed. And I'm gaining something that I can trust because it's a branded experience that's always going to be the same quality. Um, there's a bookshop in London that's been there since the 1930s in one of the most expensive parts of Mayfair. It's called Hayward Hill Books. And they were losing money year after year. They thought, we're never going to compete as retailers of books. Amazon, other online stores are going to win. They had a new managing director about six or seven years ago. And he thought, OK. We can only compete, not as experts in selling books, but as experts in helping you make decisions about books. We can only compete on our curatorial skills. They have six ladies who sit in the basement of that bookshop reading 200 books a year to work out what the good books are. And they've started the first subscription service where they get to know their customers. Many of them are foreign. They come into the shop when they're in London. They will now send you each month gift wrapped a book that they've thought about for you. And you will pay six, seven hundred, eight hundred dollars a year for this service. They now have thousands of people signing up for this. So they've turned a retail old school go into the shop, buy something, they're losing money on it, into a emotional experience where they think about you, you feel part of something, the cost becomes less material, you're in a relationship. They will do private libraries for you. They're now making millions of dollars a year by curating private libraries. And I think where we will pay more, where we will have that loyalty, is building relationships with retail businesses that decommodify that don't just provide the freeze-dried coffee experience because everybody else does, that say, actually, we care about this product. This is why I love it. And I think in some of the more interesting experiments in the last five years with you know, the Tesla retail stores um, and you know, the 
Apple retail stores. It's not about how much revenue per square meter can they make that day. It's about how can they create a sense of excitement and delight. The genius bar that doesn't try and make money from you, that helps you in a trusted way create a better brand experience, um, that pays dividends long term. I have a friend who's trying to do the same with chocolate. He's a London entrepreneur. He's realized that chocolate is as complicated and nuanced, not just as, as much as coffee, but as wine. And why don't we know more about what we're eating? So he's now working with the small suppliers around the world, and he's created a, I guess, a playlist of chocolate that you subscribe to, and you get stories with each. And people are paying vast amounts for the chocolate because they know they're part of a transparent supply chain, real people with passion building it, and a trusted brand, my friend's business, Cocoa Runners, that um, gives you access to the best. How can we have more of that curation in the retail mall? Because I'd spend more money there. Any other challenges, observations, success stories? Is anybody here innovating in a way that the rest of us should learn from? There's a microphone. Tell us just who you are. Something, yeah, this is Nick again. Earlier oh, hi. From, yeah. So just one quick thing, right? I noticed since this is something which is uh, around the corner here. So we have about 45 to 50 coffee shops that run around here. And the footfall is all the, com uh, all the office traffic. But there's one cafe new that always runs, period. I don't know why. And I'm just trying to wonder, if you're all the other coffee shops around here, how do you get that traffic off in, in, into your store, right? And that is something that I've always noticed that, you know, given so much retail is coming here, that what is it that you as a retailer is going to, uh, of a coffee shop owner, uh, would do to attract traffic in, in this part of the world? Well, I don't know the store, but I imagine that the people making the decision to go in that store have made that decision partly through online channels. Partly, people they're following have said positive things about that retailer. It's, it's not simply the physical store in isolation. Who here thinks they're ahead of all these emerging technologies and they understand all the opportunities? Who here is a bit scared of the emerging technologies? Who here thinks blockchain is a bunch of hype? Does anybody think blockchain has a use for their business? What about artificial intelligence? David, I think we're going to move on to the next guy. Oh, it's thank my time. Thank you very thank much you for, for that. Thank you for participating. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining in. Perfect. Thank you very much, David. Whale, it's all yours. I'm glad that we... I'm glad that we had a couple of nice presentations this morning, and I really um, thank you for making it up to the end of the day. Uh, but I have an amazing experience that I want to share with you, and uh, I promise I'll to make it quick and up to the point. Usually in developing shopping centers, we usually aim for 20 years plus lifespan for the mall. Imagine to do a temporary project with a three years lifespan for a temporary shopping center being made in four months in an area so dense like the one in the picture here near the Grand Mosque in Mecca, which is the compass and the direction for 1.6 billion Muslim around the world five times a day throughout the year. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to share our experience
to make this new concept, which we called Sahat al-Khalil, or al-Khalil Courtyard. My name is Wael Balkhair. I'm the CEO of Sahat Property Management Company, one of Jabal Umar subsidiaries, running one of the biggest mixed-use projects in the region. I'm also a board member of the Middle East Council of Shopping Center here in Dubai, former president of the Shopping Center Committee, and a member of the Entertainment and Tourism Committee in Jeddah Chamber, member of the advisory board of the Co Community College in King Abdelaziz University. Since the ambitious plans for the government of Saudi Arabia to expand the two holy mosques in Mecca and Al Medina, the constructions around those area didn't stop. And especially in Mecca with the nature of the land, with the mountains and the valleys, those type of construction takes time. And as we know it, that during the construction of those properties, the land cannot be used until the project is finished. So we came, about, we came out for an idea to take the front face of a project and turn it to something useful until the project finish or the construction finish. To have benefit for the landlord, for a revenue, for the retailers, for a good turnover, and for the traffic, for a better shopping experience. And we had the right location for that, which is 7,000 square meters of area, just 40 meters from Al Haram boundaries. And used to be an excavation uh, site for the foundation for a hotel, a luxurious hotel, which has been postponed for a couple of years. So we thought about using this place and turn it to achieve three goals. Number one, to revive and utilize the landscape around the Al-Haram area. And two, that we have a better shopping experience for the traffic and also for the retailers who have been afraid to get into Mecca market because of the high rent prices. Since this project is temporary, so the rents and the fit out will not cost as much as others. Number three, to turn the traffic to a buying traffic since the location behind this land is a stopover, a bus stopover for five-star hotels, residents, that goes to the Haram five times a day. So by making this project, we made sure that the majority of this traffic being converted to buying traffic. It's 7,000 square meter area, 3,000 GLA, 36 shops, and six kiosks. Since we got the land, till we get the permits, working hand in hand with the construction and the retailers with the fit out, taking the government permits, all of this happened in four months. We wanted to fulfill three of the major increasing de demands for the traffic there, which is a decent FMB offering, and easy to reach since it's in front of Al-Haram gates. And the last new thing, we wanted to make some attraction there. We made an Islamic themed museum in this area, dedicated in the green area as you saw, see here. It's a 1,600 area for a museum that is uh, that it's made to tell the story of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him followers. The other tenant mix is majority the FMB gifts and watches, and the thing is attractive for the visitors for these people in the area. Working hand in hand to get to take the municipality, the civil defense, the Amara permits. And believe it or not, in this area, there is a permit called crowd management permit. It's to make sure, is to ensure the safety of this traffic. As you see in the picture, the crowd on the area that we open need to make sure that they are safe and to elevate their experience 
during their journey. We believe that Al Khalil Courtyard is a case study that can be replicated also in other places to better utilize for the land and the projects. The project timeline, as you can see here, started mid of March by filling the land, working with the construction, and the fit out with the, with the tenants, working also to get the permits to make sure that by the, the mid of June, the site is ready for the grand opening. And we've been honored that this site been opened by the deputy governor of Mecca, Prince Badr bin Sultan. Then he opened the exhibition, which is called Ashabi Exhibition. And in this place, it's like a museum using the latest state of art to show the journey, as I told you, and the story about the early followers of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who lived in the same exact area. Before I end the, this presentation, and why did we choose uh, attraction themes like this, themed like this? We in Sahat, uh, and the name of Sahat came from Saha, or the courtyard. And we are specialized in the courtyard of Al Haram Al Makki and Al Haram Al Madani. As the retail congress themed the age of focus, we are super focused in those cities, Mecca, Medina, and Jeddah as the gateway for, the gateway for them. I would like to invite you on my next keynote on Tuesday at 12.20, which I will talk about the journey of the retail in Mecca. And Mecca can be considered one of the ancient trade hub known by, by, by mankind. The goal, then the story starts 4,000 years ago. And I will take you to the current situation and what is the perspective gonna be for the tex, uh, 10 next years. Also, I'll be talking about how do we find that Mecca and Medina market is different from anywhere else? And why do we like to call it the ninth category? All of this can be explained on the next keynote, but for the time being, I would like to share with you two videos. The first one about the courtyard itself, and the second one gonna be from inside the museum.
for leaving the space for questions. Uh, I would like to invite you, uh, starting from tomorrow, to see our exhibition in, uh, in the next room. We brought some uh, Macaui sweet, Laddu Labaniya, to tell you the flavor of Makkah. So, um, thank you. Thank you. I would leave the stage for questions. for you. Before Assalamu you ask me a hard question, I think I fulfilled my yeah. uh, promise, huh? Yeah, very, uh, very quick one. Uh, thank you, Wael, for the presentation. Uh, question about the rent rates. Uh, since the project has started with, uh, with already high rent rates through auctions, how, how you are tackling the entry point for retailer to get in such market uh, from a rent rate perspective? Okay, uh, thank you for the question, Mazin. Uh, in the beginning, yeah, I agree with you that there is a hi history for the prices in the area. For this particular project, since we are uh, controlling it from the beginning, we managed to make a study for reasonable prices uh, for the area to attract the people. For the current project that we are running in Jabal Umar, uh, which is Sug Al Khalil, and the coming projects, we made a study for the next 10 years with one of the international consultancy firm to know what the retail gonna be with the new project coming on in the area. So we had a good picture of the, of the surrounding based on that we had uh, uh, surveys to know the customers or the uh, is gonna come from which countries, what is the, the buying power based on that we form a study for the whole retail in Jabal Umar, which is gonna be by the end of the project 180,000 GLA of square meter. So for that, we presented this to Jabal Umar as the owner. We made a three year business plan and we took the approval for the new structure and new prices. So if you are a retailer and you ask us about the prices like two months back, it's different now. We have a new strategy, a new prices, and your new vision for the whole seven phases in Jabal Umar. Thank you. One question here, please. Thank you, Ayal, for the presentation. My name is Hussam. Uh, the question is, uh, what I understand, there is another food court in Jabal Umar which is not an easy accessibility like Sahat or Sahat Al Khalil. So how the competition is working on? This is my first question. My second question is, uh, do you have any project uh, in Medina? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've been very careful when we started planning for Sahat Al Khalil. As you, as you know, it's beside the other mall, which is Sug Al Khalil, which is we are managing also. So we wanted the, the offering does not contradict with each other. So some of them have outlet there on the fourth floor and outlet on uh, the uh, Khalil courtyard and they are happy about it. In the Khalil courtyard, we wanted to bring new names and we managed by attracting them with the new prices and our plan is to attract them for the next spaces coming on. So we've been very careful when we planted uh, the, the tenant mix for this project not to contradict with the others. The other question regarding Medina, yes, we have planned to work in Medina in Jeddah. As I, as I explained that we see ourselves specialized in this category, which serve, serve the pilgrims in Mecca and Medina and Jeddah as the gateway for it. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. So, if no, no more questions. Okay, thank you very much and thank you for listening. Thank you.
Thanks very much. Great presentation. And uh, thanks to all of the presenters today that came on. And uh, thank you very much. And gave their, uh, the master class session today a whole new meeting. And I know that uh, many of the people that you sitting in the audience were really enjoying what we were able to provide today. So thank you for your attention and thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. And it's a great first day at the kickoff. And tomorrow we start again at 10 o'clock in the morning. We have another fantastic lineup of speakers, and I think you've probably seen them in your magazine. You all have a copy of the magazine in front of you. So that's all there. And then I want to make sure that everyone comes to join us for our cocktail kickoff party tonight at 6 o'clock. And to tell you how to get there, you go out into the main hallway and just keep walking to the end. So it's at the other end of the hotel. And it's always a great event, and we also recognize all of our sponsors at this event. So it's a great evening, and it starts at 6 o'clock and ends usually around 8, 8.30, something like that. So thank you all for coming today so far. We look forward to seeing you this evening at 6 o'clock. And for sure, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much.